Um, you're all in for a real treat tonight. I must say, we're going to talk about infectious disease, germs, and so on. And we have a wonderful teacher here to do that for us. Um, I'm going to say, are we worried about germs? Yes. Worried about germs? yes. Once upon a time, when you went to my office, you would find a little glass thing in there with tongue blades in it, tongue depressors with no covers on them. Yeah. And took them out, and we used them. All of a sudden, they started putting paper on them. So we'd have to take them out, put the ones with the paper in there, and then all of a sudden, they started with these. Paper ones, all made in China, but <laughs> with lot numbers on them. So in case anything happened. Wow. And, and now, expiration dates. And expiration dates. Uh -huh. And now what they have, something you can't even open. These, these are peel packs. <laughs> And I can't, oh, I have difficulty peeling these back all the time, as you can see. Uh, I'm one hand. But we peel it back and we do it and we pull out this tongue depressor. Just look like the old ones. And what do we do with this nice sterile thing? We put it in the part of your body with the most germs. So, but we don't worry about the germs. We don't want to give people bad ones. Um, as usual, uh, our speaker is going to be receiving questions at the end. Please write them down on the pads that have so generously been given to us by, by Linda from Margaret Teats and give them to me and I will get them in some kind of proper order to deliver them. I want to introduce now Dr. Saranda Sigelmora, who is the director of the James Rahal Division of Infectious Disease and Jim Rahal was a great man. She uh, knows everything you want to know about germs, from <laughs> antibiotics to Zika, as the title says. She's a wonderful speaker. She is an associate professor at Cornell. And uh, she's ready. All right, thank you very much uh, for inviting this me today. This thing's here. OK. You see yourself or good? I don't see myself, but I don't want to block the slides. So let's uh, move you so you can yeah, see. Yeah, so let's, I'm going to stand right okay. here. That's, um, that's good. All so right. now you can see yourself there. Perfect. Okay, so I'll stand right here. Perfect. Anyway, thank you everybody for uh, having me tonight. Uh, antibiotics good? I don't know. Germs bad? Yes, sometimes. Uh, so I wanted to touch a couple of topics with all of you. They're in no particular order. Um, it's, I really thought a little bit about some of the questions that I'm asked about. Uh, you have the pointer? Oh, you have the pointer. I have, pointer. I okay. have everything. Okay. Um, and I put some things down. I also have some websites for all of you for some easy uh, access to get more information. I'll point those out. Uh, a lot of these are meant for folks like you. They're not sort of super technical sites. So I think you may get some nice information. Uh, we cannot possibly cover infectious diseases in one night. I could certainly talk about it for many, many hours, but you may not want to listen to it for many hours. Uh, so again, anything that you want to ask, certainly that I haven't asked uh, or spoken about tonight, feel free to do that. Um, before I start discussing some of the uh, sort of topics I chose for tonight, I want to introduce you uh, to our division. We are down the road. Uh, I have been there uh, almost 25 years. Uh, I was I went to school in the city and then I trained uh, at Einstein Montefiore. Uh, and this is uh, our division here. Um, actually, I think the, the, the pointer is, I would say there. Uh, so Dr. Rubin, I'll start with him first. He's been here 27 years and Friday he is leaving us. Uh, he's moving to practice uh, closer to his home. He lives in West Park, Connecticut, if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, it's about a two-hour drive, although it's only about, you know, 30 miles, so to speak, but, you know, with the highways being what they are. Uh, we do have an attending who will be coming in, uh, but we will miss David very much. Uh, uh, we are very good colleagues. Uh, Dr. Nishant Prasad, and I'll talk a little bit about what everybody does. He's one of our ID attendings. Uh, Dr. Carl Urban is the director of our ID research lab, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we do when I get towards the... Uh, middle of the slides. Uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Wasserman is our nutritionist in our special care clinic. Uh, this little happy guy here, we're going to wear that smile off his face. He just started, so he's all happy. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez is a pharmacist that specializes in antibiotics. 
uh, and he is the director of our antimicrobial stewardship program. And I'll explain to you what that is because that's super important. Uh, and Dr. Glenn Tourette uh, is one other of our ID attendings. So this is all of us. Uh, they got us on a really good day. They got us at 9 in the morning right after coffee. Uh, so we all look so happy. Um, and this is really what I look like before I go to sleep. Um, so we do a lot of different things, and I want to share that with all of you, um, because uh, I think when people think about infectious diseases, I, I don't know what you think. Uh, but we see patients in the hospital uh, who have various kinds of infections. They could be pneumonia, they could be skin, bone infections, they could be brain infections, so pretty much almost anything. So we see those patients in the hospital. Uh, we also see patients in the office. We have an office that's at the hospital. We also have a clinic right uh, on uh, Main Street by the LIE where we see a lot of patients with HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, we also have an outpatient antibiotic intravenous treatment unit uh, that many folks uh, have used in this area, maybe some people in the room, but I won't break uh, privacy. Uh, where patients come in and out, they get their IV antibiotics uh, once a day, every day, until they're done, so they never ever have to be an inpatient in the hospital. Uh, so they can be super sick, but they just come to us once a day, and they go back, right back home to be cared by their family. So this is a really uh, big deal, and I'll speak a little bit about that, because this is really what we call cutting edge uh, Is that medicine. better to do it that way? So it's interesting you ask, and I'm okay with taking a couple of questions in the middle. So. Uh, around the country, uh, this OPAT, it actually stands for Outpatient Parenteral, which means IV, Antibiotic Treatment, um, has been around since the early 90s, uh, where medicine, some of you may have heard about Rocephin or Ceftrioxone, uh, usually used for Lyme disease, um, was introduced. It was one of the first antibiotics that could be used once a day. So that's when lots of doctors and patients said, well, why can't I get this at home? It goes in in about 20 minutes. Why do I need to go to the hospital? So starting the early 90s, a lot of doctors started providing it in their office. But what happens with very large cities, New York City, Boston, Chicago, we have so many hospitals that we really don't do a lot of that in the office because it's just really easy. If your patient is sick, you just say, go to the emergency room, right? Patients don't really love that. If I had a show of hands, how many of you loved going to the emergency room when your doctor told you that? I bet what you would say is, what's my alternative, right? Nobody wants to do that. So five years ago, uh, actually for five years before that, I pressured the hospital to open this unit. We're the only unit of its kind in the tri-state area. Uh, there's smaller units uh, than ours. Uh, we serve between 65 to 75 patients every day. Uh, who come in, get their medicine, and they go right back out. They go to work, they go to school, they go back home. Sometimes they're babysitting kids, they bring their kids in, they go to some playground afterwards. So the quality of life uh, is really huge uh, because you don't need to sit in a hospital bed and maybe catch some germs. Um, so it is a pretty big uh, deal. Um, we also do infectious disease consultations, so we see patients with infections at Silvercrest, one of our affiliated long-term care facility. We're actually working with lots of the other long-term care facilities around. Uh, we do a lot of research, so if you Google my name or Dr. Urban's name, you'll be able to pull out a lot of our papers. Uh, we also train fellows or future doctors in infectious diseases, so a little bit of what we do. So this was the OPAT unit. We're open seven days a week, uh, and certainly all the doctors in the area know about us. Uh, we've grown tremendously over the years. And we also don't just do antibiotics. We'll give IV iron, various other things, just not cancer treatment. So I'm going to start a little bit with what's new in infections. As I said, I kind of just picked what I've been asked a lot about recently. Uh, but again, in the question and answer session, which I'll leave plenty of time for, uh, we can hit whatever it is uh, that you all have an interest to talk about. So the first thing I thought you'd want to talk about Zika, because everybody wants to talk about Zika. So I assumed, and if I did wrong, I'm sorry, but I thought at some point tonight, I might as well talk about the elephant in the room, or in this case, the mosquito in the room. And actually, I got bitten on my arm in my office. So that's, that's my, uh, that's my uh, Zika uh, mosquito story. 
So here's your mosquito. Uh, it actually, uh, if any of you ask me if this is the actual size, no it's not. But after a mosquito bite, you think that this is the actual size because we get this really uh, allergic reaction. But it has um, those white dots on it? Uh, yeah, it's actually, as little things go, it's kind of pretty. Uh, as long as it's on a slide and not on your arm, it is actually kind of attractive. Um, and yes, sometimes, uh, last summer, this summer they've been pretty tiny. Last summer, uh, they were much larger. You could actually see the stripes as it landed uh, on your arms. It was more or less like LaGuardia, the kind of zzz landing when you actually saw it. Okay, so what I wanted uh, to start with is what's new about Zika. And this is the most important thing. Zika is not new. Absolutely not. You all are hearing about it, but uh, if you have really great eyesight, uh, you would see that there's reports that start here in 1945 with Zika. So nothing about it is new. And the same thing with Ebola. We all heard about it several years ago, but it is not a new virus. It was described 30, 40, 50 years ago or more. So you're hearing about it because it's coming closer to home because it's involved in some outbreaks where a whole bunch of people get infected. So that's why you're hearing about it. But it is not a new virus. Uh, it's actually related, as viruses go, Zika is related to dengue. Dengue is found in tropical countries, actually around the world tropical countries. Everyone thinks the Caribbean, but it's actually around the world. Chikungunya, you heard about that a few years ago. Where is that today? Well, it hasn't gone away. Uh, but that is still around, again, tropical countries where lots of mosquitoes live. And Zika is very closely related to all those viruses. We'll talk a little bit more about the infection. What I wanted to show you is, this is obviously a map around the world. Uh, all of these areas that are in color, so this is Africa, uh, this is India, Pakistan, this is Southeast Asia, uh, this is South America, Mexico. These are a whole bunch of islands in the South Pacific. That is everywhere where Zika is. And if you had super great eyesight, you would see that underneath each name is a year, and each year is when the countries or those islands first experienced large numbers of patients being infected. And what's very nice, something that I do, which is kind of fun, it's like detective stuff, right? You follow things, and you figure stuff out, and you kind of figure out puzzles. A bunch of people comes, come in, and they're all sick and with a really similar illness, and you start asking them where they've been. So that's kind of fun. It's being a sort of medical detective. So that's part of infectious diseases, uh, which I find a lot of fun. Um, so you can actually see uh, the years here are very clustered. And if you're very interested in this, you can read on the CDC website that it had a lot to do with tourists and on various vacation packages the various tourist companies travel to specific islands in a specific order and you could narrow it down the bunch of travelers that got sick with what company in what order to what island uh, and not other islands because they didn't visit other islands so very, very interesting. Of course, they became symptomatic when they came back home. So that is something that we do to follow infections around the world. Um, not very well up here uh, in terms of the lighting, uh, but some of the symptoms with Zika, and I'll show you on the next slide, is usually these sort of bloodshot eyes, a rash, lots of joint pains, uh, and actually here you can see the rash is a little bumpy, some joint swelling, uh, and fever. And people can have symptoms somewhere between a couple of days to about a week after being bitten by an infected mosquito. And in general, the symptoms last about a week and then they just go away. And most people, 80% of people, have no idea until we do blood tests, we call that zero survey. Serum is a blood test survey. You're looking for who's infected. And then you discover that these people must have been infected at some point. So that's how we know that most people were never sick. Very similar, as I'm sure many of you may have been involved years ago with the West Nile virus outbreaks. And I don't know how many of you uh, were around many years ago. Our hospital was sort of at the center of the epidemic. We worked very closely with the Department of Health. And the Department of Health 
didn't really have a good handle on who was infected. So they literally went door to door, knocking on doors, and asking people for a few drops of blood, just so they could test. And they, it turned out that probably around 70, 80 percent of the people in this area in Flushing had been infected, and they never knew they had been infected with West Nile and got over it. So that's part of Sierra survey. Fun, right? Okay, what I wanted to add here is we all talk about, and I didn't have pictures of those terribly deformed babies. Uh, we all talk about, it's called microcephaly, the very tiny uh, skulls and the very tiny brains and very impaired children. Um, we talk about that because it's very devastating. It does not happen very often, but what we see more often than that is a neurologic uh, problem which is called Guillain-Barre. Some of you may have heard about that. It can be very dramatic uh, and very frightening uh, because you slowly, slowly start to lose sensation and the ability to move your legs. Well, first your feet, then your legs, then your body, then your arms, and then you may not be able to breathe. You may need to be on a ventilator in the hospital for a short period of time till you recover. So that's Guillain-Barre. That actually is seen more often with Zika. Uh, we're not talking about it because people are just very, very affected by what's happening to babies. But again, that doesn't happen as often as the Guillain Barre. The good news when we, well, if there is good news, but you have to see it from my point of view, when there is Guillain Barre, this neurologic problem that happens with Zika, it tends to get better within about a week or so. So it's very dramatic, it's very scary, but it does get better over a short period of time. But we do see that a little bit more, and we as doctors know about that, and we know to look for that. So you can't really read this. This is really for me to remind, uh, to remind me to tell you. It's the rash, uh, the feeling feverish, the having joint pain, the bloodshot eyes, the headache, and just feeling really lousy. Those are your major symptoms. Um, what I think all of you probably want to talk about, if you yourselves are not of childbearing age, uh, you have relatives, you have daughters, you have cousins, you have friends, you have neighbors. Uh, so the really huge question is around pregnancy. Okay, let me start before I address that. For the people who are not in that time of life, so me, myself, I'm no longer in that time of life. I have nothing to worry about when it comes to Zika. If I get it, I'll be uncomfortable. I do have that small risk for the neurologic problems, but other than that, it doesn't matter. I cannot spread it to someone else. Uh, I will maybe get sick, maybe not, and then quickly recover about a week later. So anyone other than people in that childbearing age or the partners, the people who are helping in that childbearing age, don't really have anything to be overly concerned about. However, as with any of these mosquito-related diseases, you should always protect yourself. I actually did make a slide about that. Uh, you should use various sprays. Most people use DEET. I just started, uh, uh, what did I just start recently? I think oil of eucalyptus or something, lemon eucalyptus, because the, the spray we're using in our backyard have done nothing. I think they're just attracting mosquitoes. Uh, so I started next with eucalyptus. I smell really good. I don't know if I'm uh, defending myself against mosquitoes. Try not to go out around early dawn where it's nice and uh, sort of dark outside and real moist. And try not to go out in dusk uh, unless, again, you're spraying to protect yourself against mosquitoes so that you don't get various kinds of uh, illnesses. Now, for the people in the childbearing age and the partners, uh, the husbands, the partners of these women, so this is off the CDC website. Uh, this is their uh, interim guidance. Uh, nothing has changed. This is from back in April. Uh, nothing has been updated. So for women, they need to wait at least eight weeks or two months after uh, they've gotten sick. Now, how do women know they're sick? Well, you have symptoms, and if you're not sick, uh, there is discussion now if you need to be tested before you start <clears throat> trying to get pregnant. Uh, the men, the partners of these women, need to wait at least six months uh, before trying to have a child uh, with uh, uninfected uh, women. So, 
Uh, if there's been possible exposure, you don't know if you've been exposed or not, but you travel, let's say, to, uh, to Brazil, uh, you really need to wait at least two months or so before trying uh, to have a baby. So that is the official Department of Health guidance uh, and the CDC. And I think I have <clears throat> one more slide and then I'll take questions. I don't expect you to read this. What I wanted to show you is that all <coughs> emergency rooms around New York City have this kind of chart. When somebody comes, they do a history, and once the history is good for Zika or so the woman is pregnant, there are certain blood tests that need to be gotten, and that's on this chart. So I just wanted to show you what it is we're looking at, and then we have a way of interpreting it. Uh, so there is a very, very careful way of looking at a pregnant woman, figuring out the assessment, if she's symptomatic, what blood tests to get, and how to follow her up, et cetera. So again, it's really not meant for you to read along, but just to know that we actually have a step-by-step -step way of taking care <clears throat> of these women. Okay, before I go to the next, there's some Zika questions, yes. so now's a good time. Okay, yes. I'm gonna steal some water. Did you put this for me? Yes. Oh, excellent. May I bother you? I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. yes. I read that besides Gillian Barre, yes. seniors are at risk for other neurological problems. So other than Gillian Barre, there's various other things that happen incredibly rarely, so not more than any other viral illness, no. What happens if someone is in the early stage of pregnancy and doesn't know? So that is when women and OBG, the obstetricians already know about this. If they have a pregnant woman, they all have started following the city guidance in terms of testing. So again, I know you can't see it from back there, uh, but it starts with pregnant women. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole assessment, if yes, if no, and it goes all the way down. Yeah, that's why I put it there, just to show you that there's a very, very careful assessment that goes on. I thought that's a serious question. Um, that wasn't serious? That was pretty serious. <laughs> no, it's going to sound funny, but like every, every year you hear about a new disease, you know, yeah. it, and it's almost like it's um, the news people are just trying to... And I'll have a job forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's kind of like, every, you know, last year was a bird flu, then it was yeah. rust now. Every year, who knows what it is next year? Yeah. Are, are these diseases really that dangerous, or is it just um, they're trying to like make you watch the news? Uh, no, some of them can be very, very dangerous. Ebola was very, very dangerous. Uh, the reason we all got very nervous is because, especially you guys are a little closer to JFK than I am a mile away, uh, but we have a lot of travelers, so you never know. You, New York is such a big place, and you never know what you're going to see. Uh, so there's a lot of things around the world. I obviously get to hear a lot more about them than the general public, so I guess I'm a little bit more immune, and I don't get as excited, but it can be very frightening. Um, if any of you have traveled in some very exotic locations, maybe safaris or uh, off the beaten track or maybe beaten down the block at uh, the nice Chinese restaurant, I'm just joking, nothing personal, I don't know who owns it, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but if you've been off the beaten path and you've traveled to exotic locations, you certainly will get all sorts of vaccinations and your doctor will go through all sorts of symptoms with you if you get this and if you get this and come back to me after your trip if this and this. So there are things all around the world. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the end of what you can do. I'll take two more questions and then we'll go on. A person who has overcome a Zika virus, do they have a natural immunity to getting it a second time? Or they so it is, thought, time? it is thought that people will be immune and not get it another time. Now, everything is subject to possible change as we do more research. So it is thought that once you get it, that's it. Similar to West Nile, but because Zika is related to dengue, Dengue, you can get a few more times. So right now, I want to say yes, but I want to put it in gray and not in black, because we think that. Yes? Um, once, God willing, once a baby is born healthy, um, is there a danger to the baby going out and getting Zika? Yeah, so the babies are not sort of carrying Zika. The damage has already been done. 
Uh, the question right now, there's actually a very nice editorial in one of the newspapers within uh, the last few months ago. Um, the question is going forward, let's say 5, 10, 20, 30 years, what will happen to these children? Will they have some sort of what we call the late sequelae or the late changes following an infection? We will learn with time. Uh, obviously, pediatricians are watching these kids who are going to be born or are born from these moms. A lot of the infections, if you look around the world, that map of the world I showed you, um, there are areas that are challenged medically uh, where they don't have all the resources we have here. So it is sometimes very hard to look at those areas and say, this is what will happen if this occurs in the United States. But then, if the baby is born normal, is the baby also in danger of Zika once it's here? No, the baby will not have Zika or spread Zika, but the question that I, I was sort of taking you one step past that, will, even though the baby is normal, is there some small change that you may not pick up till that baby is 5 years old, 10 years old, 20 years old? So they're following those kids very carefully. So I'm going to go on because this is what I want to talk about with all of you, uh, which is antibiotics, right? That's a really big to-do topic, and I'll show you also some very nice websites that you can uh, access. So because many times I'm asked uh, for antibiotics when patients are sick, I kind of title this what you should know before you ask for antibiotics. I'm not assuming that you're all asking for antibiotics, but I thought that would be a catchy title. So I want to start a little bit with this really wonderful CDC website. It's called Get Smart. Uh, you can all access this. It's www.cdc.gov. Uh, and once you get on the CDC website, just put in Get Smart and you'll get all this lovely stuff. Um, if you're doing any sort of education at schools, if you guys have kids in schools or are volunteering and, you know, show and tell, this is really nice. There's a lot of consumer booklets that you can get off the website uh, if you're doing certainly all sorts of uh, center type uh, education. Uh, they're very nice. So. There is a huge global threat with the drug-resistant bacteria, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Uh, this actually happens to be one of our main focus for research in our laboratory. Uh, we're actually internationally known for the research we've done uh, with antibiotic-resistant bacteria for the last uh, 30 years almost. Um, there are deaths around the world. I know you can't really read this, but again, you can all have access to this. Uh, 60,000 babies die at least, uh, uh, at least in India per year because of the resistant bacterial infections uh, where most antibiotics do not work and you literally are watching people die. Um, I'll talk to you about the United States uh, in a little bit and there are many worldwide initiatives uh, as to tracking these bacteria and testing for them and controlling uh, antibiotics. I'll talk about controlling antibiotics in a minute. So, resistance travels around the globe. Uh, you can all get on a plane and move from here to there. Uh, you can all sneak some fabulous food you bought somewhere onto your suitcase, like I frequently do. My husband yells at me and tells me that the dog stopped me at the airport. He's out of there and he doesn't know me. So, certainly you can bring things with you. Uh, you all know, I'm sure many of you have been out of the country, you need to fill on that little form when you come back, have you been to farms, right? Uh, because the question is, especially if you've been hiking and all that, the soil will get into your boots. You'll have all sorts of seeds and maybe some manure from animals. You bring that here, you walk around your backyard, your dog eats it up, and now your dog will be carrying some antibiotic resistant bacteria. So this is easy now. Uh, years ago, this wasn't so very easy to do, but now we're traveling everywhere. We have access, uh, unfortunately, we have access to resistant bacteria. Uh, the one that many of you have read about recently uh, has been Carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, long name, CRE. It's been in the newspaper recently. Uh, the one that's also made the news is this New Delhi metallobeta-lactamase. And a lot of times we'll name these resistant bacteria by the first place where we saw it, or sometimes by the name 
of the patient where in whom it was discovered. But that doesn't mean don't go to India because you're going to catch this, uh, because this particular resistant bacteria is actually quite uh, has made its way quite around the world. Uh, so just so that uh, you know that you don't get uh, any misunderstanding. Um, let me go to the next slide. Uh, these are the latest CDC data. Uh, we know that at least 2 million illnesses are caused by antibiotic resistant bacteria per year, uh, leading to at least 23,000 deaths. Uh, this was data from about two years ago. The CDC takes time uh, to publish their data, so now you could possibly say that it's 50% greater or more. So definitely something that may certainly affect you. You live in New York City large urban areas with lots of hospitals, lots of people, lots of infections, you have a much greater risk of being exposed to uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So how does resistance happen? This is actually on the CDC website, uh, so you can look at this yourselves, uh, and uh, you know, I'm going through things pretty fast here. So you have lots of bacteria, lots of germs uh, in one spot, and you can pick antibiotic resistance in a number of ways. If you're using, it could be our fault as doctors, if we're using the wrong antibiotic, or an antibiotic that's not powerful enough, or an antibiotic that we don't dose properly. Maybe we give you half a dose when we really should give you a much higher dose. So anytime the bacteria is not seeing a full power, full dose antibiotic, What's going to happen is you're going to kill the really sensitive bacteria, but the ones that are a little hardier will survive. So a few days later, or could be a week later, you now have these really tough bacteria that take over, and what they then can do is they can share that genetic material, the DNA, to other bacteria. So I know this sounds a little bit like science fiction, and it's pretty scary, and yes, it is really scary, and it is real. And this is what we battle all the time. Uh, we're battling this with our older patients, especially the ones who are in nursing homes, uh, because they end up being weaker with many more medical problems. Many of them are not moving around as well as they could be. Uh, maybe they're getting urine infections. Maybe they're getting very bad pneumonias. Uh, and with time and multiple treatment courses, we end up with antibiotic resistant bacteria. So this is happening around the corner, not necessarily around the world. So what I wanted to show you uh, is what we have been focusing on, certainly at our hospital for well over 10 years, uh, and certainly the CDC is making a huge push. Uh, they're looking at many physicians uh, or practitioners who are using and giving patients antibiotics that maybe they don't need. So this was a survey that was done in 2013 that looked at all the antibiotics prescribed in the United States, uh, how many of them were unnecessary or not, should not have been given, or were the wrong antibiotics. And what you see here is lots of the more uh, southern parts of the country, lots more prescriptions. Uh, however, we're not so great. This is New York State. Uh, we're not doing so fabulous. Uh, where you have other parts of the country where most people are either not asking or not getting antibiotics when they should not be. So a lot that we can do about that. So a couple of facts, sort of uh, the little bit of things that we can share with you when we need antibiotics. So number one, they truly are life-saving. That is for sure. Um, and before I go on to infections, I do want to put one point of education uh, because I deal with this all the time, so it's a real sort of uh, sore point for me. Many patients will come in and they'll say, I have an antibiotic allergy. Frequently, it will be a penicillin allergy. We are very careful, and I would hope all doctors are careful, but we in infectious diseases specifically are very careful because this is our bread and butter antibiotics, right? We will ask, what happened? If the answer was, I got an upset stomach, that is not an allergy. All antibiotics can give you an upset stomach. We're sorry about that. It's a bad side effect, but that is not an allergy. Yeah, what we're looking for is a skin rash, 
that may still be okay with certain antibiotics. If the allergy, if it's a skin rash, and it was more than 20 years ago, or many times, I look around the room and I feel so close because you look like so many of my patients, they'll say to me, Doc, I don't know. My mother told me when I was two years old that I had something. I don't know what it was, and I'm 55 years old. I could probably try you with that antibiotic again because the body loses memory of some of these reactions. But if you say to me, and you mean it, that a few years ago I took something, my throat swelled, my tongue swelled, I got blotches and hives on my body, I'm going to say, okay, we're going to rethink that. Let's see if we have alternatives. The reason I'm making a point, always tell your doctor the full history around any reaction you've had. Don't just say you have an allergy, because if the doctor's not careful, they'll just put an allergy. Your records travel with you. And you may have a life-threatening infection. And they'll look at the list of allergies and say, okay, well, we can't treat you because you're allergic to everything. And now you're so sick you can't even talk to give history. So please be careful what you tell, and if you do have a reaction, tell what it is and how long ago it was. So we can judge if this is life-threatening, we may want to take a chance to save your life. So let us help you do that, but just please be careful what you say uh, happened to you. So antibiotics can absolutely be life-saving. Uh, it is, I want to say, the beautiful part of what I do. Uh, because I can have a patient who is near death in every way, uh, without blood pressure, being on a ventilator, having the family at the bedside ready to say goodbye. We give some antibiotics, we wait 24, 48 hours, and that patient can physically walk out of the hospital uh, within a week or two. It is amazing when that happens, and it reminds me why does I love what I do. Uh, but again, antibiotics can be life-saving things. So take them very seriously. They can hurt you, but they can also save your life. Um, they only treat bacterial infections, and I'll come back to why I'm making a really big deal about that. Um, lots of other infections, ear infections, runny noses, sore throats, those are 95% of the time caused by viruses. Unfortunately, they make you feel terrible, and we have nothing to give you other than hot tea, chicken soup, Tylenol, bed rest, and a dark room. And what grandma told me to do, I tell my patients to do, and that is really the end of that. Antibiotics will do absolutely nothing and will only give you side effects, like that upset stomach, etc. I'll do questions in just one minute. Um, the other thing that guides patients is, well, you know, I had a runny nose and all that, but now I'm coughing this nasty green stuff. Sorry, I don't mean to gross people out. Is that a time for antibiotics? I don't know. It depends. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So just because that happens doesn't mean automatically we'll give you antibiotics. There are many risks. We talked about allergies a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about diarrhea. Again, you have to live in my world. These things I don't find disgusting, but many people do, so I apologize. There is something that's called C. difficile or Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Many of you are nodding your head. You either read about it, you've heard about it, a loved one had it, or you yourself had it. Yeah. It actually is life-threatening, without a doubt. And again, I'm not being dramatic, I'm being honest. It is a side effect of any antibiotic. So when we prescribe antibiotic, we consider the risks and the benefits. If the benefit is much greater than the risk, it's okay, we've made a choice. But if somebody has a viral infection, a sore throat, a runny nose, the risk is much greater than any benefit you can get. So we will say no. Unfortunately, many of my patients, well, they're used to me now, but many of them at the beginning walked away very upset. But I feel terrible. And I'll say, I'm really sorry. I understand. But this antibiotic will do nothing that you want it to do. It will only give you side effects. 
So let me just do one more slide and then we'll pause and take questions. So when you go on that CDC website, and I put it down here for you, it's cdc.gov and it's called Get Smart and it'll give, give you all sorts of things, all sorts of commonly asked questions. Uh, it'll be sort of a checklist of what's wrong and when is it time for an antibiotic. Uh, it'll give you things uh, for children as well in terms of a little bit of education for that. It's a terrific website, so like all good parents, as my kids would be horrified, I'm going to give you homework. So other than giving you all the information, I'm going to tell you afterwards, go on your own and check out the website. So let me pause for a second and I'll take a couple of questions. Let me see, we're going to the next. Um, I'll leave, actually let me do the dentist and I'll do some questions. So there are a lot of concerns about dental cleaning and getting infections from dental cleaning and taking antibiotics to prevent that. The American Heart Association has very, very tight uh, guidelines uh, or rules about who should be taking antibiotics to prevent heart infection called endocarditis. So they used to be sort of very broad and general, but in, after 2007, there's only a couple of, of people who are at risk for it with particular problems with their hearts. So anybody having dental cleaning who just has diabetes, maybe a little heart failure, maybe a little high blood pressure, should not be getting antibiotics going to the dentist. So I just wanted to mention that. And I know there's questions, but I want to pause at the next se section. Um, so this, uh, I sort of put a couple of things here. Let's start reading this. Uh, finish the course. If you've been given seven days and you feel better in three days, don't stop in three days because I'm going to track you down and I'm going to like yell at you. Don't do that because what you're doing is doing what that slide showed you. You're killing all that sensitive bacteria and you're stopping. So now the bacteria that's a little bit more resistant is going to start growing. So the next time you're sick, maybe a few months from now, you might have resistant bacteria in there. So if you've been given seven days, please finish the seven days. Remember that there are millions of bacteria you're fighting. It's not two or three. The other thing, I found this adorable cartoon. This is not mine. So this is a bacteria. They don't all look that cute, but this one's really cute. He is saying, I'm so cold. And the other bacteria is uh, urging him on, no, you hold on, Johnson. The human didn't take the full course of antibiotics. You're going to make it. And here he is, all happy and ready to get you. So please finish your antibiotics. Um, I'm going to pause here because I want to talk about stewardship next. So any questions quickly about antibiotics? It's okay, Mel, that we take a couple of questions. Okay. What about a dentist who gives antibiotics after some kind of surgery? So if you're getting antibiotics after surgery, there must have been something wrong. The dentist either found an infection there. To prevent infection. So it depends. So the question is about taking antibiotics to prevent infection after some sort of oral surgery. It depends. It depends what kind of surgery it is, how deep it is, if it's near bone. And the mouth, as Dr. Bright said, the mouth is the dirtiest part of your body. Believe it or not. Well, we can talk about that in terms of survival and the teeth and the brushing and all sorts of that. Uh, but the mouth is a very, very nasty little area. And actually, um, there's a rule. Uh, you know about cat bites and dog bites and infections, right? I'm sure you've all heard or read or whatever. A human bite is the worst, worse than a dog bite, worse than any animal bite is a human bite. Uh, because it has so much bacteria in the mouth. Can antibiotics cause pigmentation of the skin when exposed to the sun? So antibiotics changing pigmentation of the skin. The most common antibiotics that we warn with sun exposure are tetracyclines, uh, like minocycline, uh, doxycycline, and also uh, Bactrim, sulfur-containing antibiotics. You will see on the bottles a little warning. Um, 
too much sun exposure when you're taking these antibiotics or even minimal sun exposure, you can end up almost with a third degree sunburn. Uh, my son last year had Lyme disease. He was uh, leading a group of kids on big hikes every day. He was working for the state uh, the park department. Uh, and he came home, he sure had a huge big old Lyme rash on his back. He went on doxycycline and we went on a beach vacation. He sat under the umbrella with sunscreen, with a t-shirt, everything. He ended up just like a boiled lobster, uh, and he peeled so much of his skin off. So even tiny bits, if you're on those specific antibiotics, check the bottle, because the pharmacists are really good with those labels. And if you see protect for sun exposure, it's called photosensitivity. Be very careful. They mean it. What about eating chicken? Chicken's very good for you. No. I don't think like don't eat the skin. Don't they use like antibiotics in chicken? Okay. So you're asking about animal feed and antibiotics, and absolutely. And it's one of the biggest concerns around the world in terms of antibiotic resistance. And there's a very big movement among all animal growers uh, to stop giving animals antibiotics. Um, however, just because you're buying at the supermarket and paying four times the price, you know, antibiotic-free chicken and all of that, Remember, these animals are being slaughtered together, maybe not as clean as they could be. Make sure you wash your meats properly, cook them fully, uh, and make sure that you're not letting food sit around sort of room temperature uh, for a very long time. Just be very careful around cooking techniques. The CDC, I actually do a little bit of training around that at various health facilities. The CDC has a fabulous, fabulous um, uh, sort of, they're wonderful for education around food safety. So if you're interested about temperature and the washing and all this, just do cdc.gov and look up food safety or cooking temperatures or any of that. It's very lovely in terms of education. For the last 50 years, I've been telling everybody I had a severe reaction to an antibiotic called Deglomycin. And invariably, whatever doctor or nurse, whatever that I say it to, says, what's that? Is it still available? Why don't they know about it? Yeah, it's almost never used. Uh, so uh, that's probably why nobody knows about it. Uh, I certainly have never used it, uh, nor have I read about any kinds of infections nowadays that uh, we would use it in. So. I'm going to do one more question, and then we'll move on, and then, yep, you. I have a question about silver hydrosol. Uh, can uh, bacteria develop a resistance to it? And also, how effective is it on all forms of bacteria? So using it as a cream? Using it internally and or externally. So I have no familiarity with using it internally, but there's various kinds of silver products uh, that are used in medicated ointments. Uh, specifically for patients who have all sorts of sores. Uh, for example, some of our diabetic patients uh, with very poor circulation or patients with poor circulation end up with sores on their feet or their legs. So a lot of times we will use some silver or zinc preparations uh, to protect the skin and they have quite a bit of uh, antibacterial or um, activity against germs. They affect all but bacteria? So, most bacteria, not all bacteria. So let me do the last piece, and then I have a couple more slides. So the last piece is what's called antibiotic stewardship. And stewardship really means taking care of something. And this is taking care of antibiotics. And it covers a couple of things. The first is don't use if you don't need. And that's for us as doctors and for you as patients, or possible patients, future patients. Um, if you go to use, use the right antibiotic, use the right dose, and then use it for the right amount of time. So all of that is called stewardship together. So this has been a huge uh, drive for the CDC. We've actually had a stewardship program at our hospital for 10 years now. We do a lot of work, a lot of research with it. I'll show you in a minute what we're doing that's uh, very cutting edge. Um, so you can see here that uh, here in the light color is where you want to be. Uh, these are the people who are doing antibiotic stewardship, and this is New York State. So even though we weren't doing so well about giving prescriptions to patients who didn't need them, 
Uh, when it comes to doing antibiotic stewardship in a hospital, uh, we are among the top uh, in the country. So this is what we received. We're one of the few hospitals in New York City to have received this. It's from the United Hospital Fund. Uh, and we uh, have put into place an outpatient uh, antibiotic stewardship program that is not very commonly done. Uh, we have been selected across the New York area and what we've done is we've selected several of our clinics that work with our hospital and starting to educate clinicians, educating patients uh, and we're very excited. We're having a conference call in another couple of weeks and then we're going to start a phase two and hopefully what United Hospital Fund wants to do is they want to use this as a pilot study, sort of a small study and if it works they want to sort of spread this out around the United States. Uh, so this is very exciting. We're very pleased that we're selected as a site. So, uh, what can you do to prevent infections? Number one, uh, it absolutely is uh, the body and the mind, and I completely believe that. Uh, get out there, move a little bit. Uh, obviously, never overdo exercise, but move as you are allowed to do or feel good to do. Uh, be active, keep your mind active. Uh, there have been quite a few articles and books uh, in the last uh, several years that talk about as we age, uh, you know, we all look forward to retiring and taking it easy, so to speak. Uh, that's probably the worst thing that you can do. Uh, and as people get older, mental exercises, memory games, puzzles, all sorts of things like that. Having, you know, your kids teach you how to Skype. Uh, having my kids teach me all the fun technology stuff, it helps you keep your brain exercising. Your brain is like another muscle in your body, and if you don't use it, it goes away, uh, and it goes away pretty fast. Uh, so that's one absolute important thing. Keep everything moving, uh, you know, both in mind and in spirit. Uh, absolutely, I'm a huge, huge believer that we are not meant to get our nutrition from pills. Uh, I'm a huge believer in a balanced diet. I'm very, very old-fashioned. I was raised uh, in Europe. I came here when I was 10, so I'm very, very old-fashioned about this. Uh, have a balanced diet, eat your vegetables, eat your salad, wash everything really well, but eat all of the stuff, eat your fruit, eat your protein, your meats, everything lean, eat grains, uh, everything in moderation. Uh, but eat a little bit of everything because that's how we as humans are programmed to get our nutrition, not from bottles of many different vitamins. It's a huge industry. Clearly, if we have medical problems and we're missing particular vitamins, that's very different. You really do need to take those supplements. Uh, but most of us who are not, I truly believe uh, a balanced diet uh, is very important. Uh, washing hands, uh, soap and water, I want to talk about this. Uh, this is number one, two, and three. As I said, I'm incredibly old-fashioned. Uh, I was never allowed into my home. Uh, my grandmother raised me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, that was probably my grandmother sort of reminding me that she raised me. Uh, my grandmother raised me, and uh, as I came home from school, I'll never forget, my first trip was to walk across the house without my shoes, of course. The shoes that were left at the door. Uh, walk across the house and wash my hands with soap and water and then I could do whatever I wanted. Uh, but there was nothing I could do until I did that. So very much soap and water. Their FDA is currently involved in regulating those alcohol soaps that you all know about and maybe carry with you. Um, the one uh, positive about soap and water uh, is not just the soap itself, any old soap, antibacterial soap, it doesn't much matter. It's really the action of the water as it drags all that grime off your hands. So it's the soap and then the water moving things off. Clearly the alcohol rubs don't quite do that, right? The grime is still there, but you hope you've killed most of the bacteria with the alcohol that's in those preparations. Psychologically, I don't love it. Does it work? Yes, it works. I still prefer soap and water myself, but clearly you could be in places where that's not possible. You've been on the train and bus, you're about to starve to death, you have to have that cookie right there. So of course you're going to use your alcohol rub uh, on your hands. Uh, but if you have a choice, I strongly recommend soap and water. 
Uh, this is very basic. Cover your mouth when you cough and sneeze. Uh, I clearly uh, don't need to tell any of you that. It's just real common sense. If you do that, you will block between 80 to 90 percent of whatever infection you have. And if after that you wash your hands with soap and water, you're going to cut another 5 to 10 percent off. So your family will be nice and safe. Uh, this is the last piece I'm going to talk about. I'm a huge believer, and full disclosure, I'm a huge believer in vaccines. Nobody should be dying nowadays from polio or chicken pox or measles. Uh, it's a real shame uh, for anyone to be ill from that, especially young children, uh, to have measles and then to go on and develop what's called encephalitis. Uh, where you have measles infection of the brain and then they are out for the count for the rest of their lives. Uh, they'll be uh, more or less like a living vegetable. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, we have vaccines that prevent that, so I'm a huge believer uh, in that. Um, before I do that, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, some more antibiotic questions and I'm going to finish up with vaccines.